Hello, everyone, and welcome to ESA Investor Forum Estonia. We are ready to begin. If you can find yourself a seat, that would be great. First off, we're going to start with a couple of speeches and then move on to uh, company pitches. And then we're going to have a panel discussion as well and then finish off with a couple of pitches as well. When the program ends at 6 o'clock, you are all very welcome to join us in a restaurant roof, which is uh, one flight of stairs downstairs. And you can find the door uh, leading to it right next to the wardrobe. So without further ado, I would like to welcome on stage our first speaker, uh, Maud Mulek from uh, the European uh, Space Agency. Welcome, everybody. Today is a pleasure to see all of you. Uh, should it be representatives of Estonian delegation of startups that I've known, incubated, selected, um, or companies that are in, interested in uh, cybersecurity? Um, today, we're going to select, uh, we're going to launch the conversation between investors and startups. On what theme? On cybersecurity. And why is it important today? Well, you know, the geopolitical circumstances make us want to be more protective of our assets. That is the first point. Estonia is the most digitally advanced countries in Europe, so that's the second point. And third, we're always looking for opportunities for to invest in new verticals for companies and how space can improve this. So I think that we're going to have hear a lot of interesting things today. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs> Thank you, Maud. Uh, next up, we have uh, some opening words from the Estonian space delegation as well. Paulias, please. <laughs> so, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the invest um, investor forum uh, here in Tallinn. And uh, today, yeah, it's it's a very honor to be here and talk to you because. Uh, one of the biggest challenges what we are facing in Estonia is that uh, Estonian companies are not really... Okay, we are known for, or Estonia is known for, that um, we have the highest number of uh, venture capital investments per capita. But somehow still our companies are not really investing themselves into R&D activities. So it's not covered in the statistics. And uh, one of the main tasks for us in the Minister of Economic Affairs and Communication, which is the shorter version is more known for as a space ministry, uh, how to raise the number. So how can uh, our companies be more uh, involved in technology and have more R&D activities? And therefore, we as a government, we are planning to do here a lot more. And uh, therefore, of course, having uh, more student activities like S-Cube, uh, S-Cube 2 and hopefully S-Cube 3 and 5. It's, I think, very, very important for us. And um, these activities will lead to startups. And I think ESA-BIC has been a very, very good and successful form format for us because we have had more than 20 startups, I think, uh, ordered it today. And uh, the majority, I think all of them are still living and uh, what's even more important for us, they are creating revenue and doing a very good job in attracting investments. So it really shows that uh, having uh, ISABIC is the best thing uh, what we can do. And having the dialogue between the ministry and also the startup community, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a right way. Uh, it is the right way forward. I remember that uh, 2000. 17 exactly. It was the November, November 2017 when ISABIC was launched. So I hope that soon we will see already 10 years of ISABIC. So I think it's uh, just a, yeah, a few years missing. <laughs> and um, today the focus is uh, in Estonia. What we are doing is, of course, on cybersecurity. It's one of the key areas in, uh, in, uh, for our space policy. And if, if I go somewhere to talk about the stone space and what we are doing in the space domain, then it's quite, Estonia is quite often referred to that, yeah, you are the best one in cyber, cyber and uh, software. 
it's true, but not only. So our startups, also in ESAP Estonia, have been very successful in uh, developing hardware. So it's maybe something uh, um, that you know people forget about Estonia. So for example, skeleton technology. Unfortunately, ESAP was wasn't there back then, uh, but I think it's um, uh, it is something. Uh, I mean. If, if you think back, if we would have had ESA Big in 2013, maybe 2010, we, which companies would be ESA Big companies? Skeleton Technologies, Bolt, Bolt. So I think already then we would have a number of unicorn companies. And our previous uh, minister has set for us a very uh, straightforward KPI, which means that uh, in the year 2025, we should, Estonia should have. A, 25 unicorn companies. So we have still 15 uh, companies missing. And uh, what also uh, Minister Switch said one year ago after the uh, ministerial meeting uh, in Portugal is that the next uh, unicorn company will come from the space domain. So it's a clear ambition also from our ministry side that we need to do a lot more in the space domain. Today I can already see that uh, a number of uh, those, let's say, 20 startups from ESA Pick have already the potential to become a unicorn. And I really hope that uh, we can achieve it. And uh, therefore, if you are now looking to the next, next period of um, um, ESA programs, so the next ministerial meeting, which will happen in uh, more or less exactly in one, uh, one month, it also gives us an uh, idea in which direction we should invest. It's clear that uh, having ESABIC and supporting the ESABIC companies to grow, I think it's the right, right direction. And uh, from our delegation side, we will, of course, give the best uh, performance uh, to achieve it. Um, and uh, yes, I think it's uh, the main messages I have already covered and said. If there are any maybe questions, then of course you can. Uh, you are free to free to come to me uh, afterwards, and uh, I think it's more important. It's more, it will be more interesting to hear to the, for the pitches and then listen to the panel afterwards. So thank you. Moving on with the program, next up we have a keynote speech from uh, Paul Durguba, who is the Project Manager for Privacy Technologies in Cybernetica. Please. Hi, nice to see you. So, startups, please raise your hand. Uh, venture capitalists, please raise your hand. <sighs> I'm a statistician by education. <laughs> so um, I think um, the reason why I'm here is that space technologies and space projects have a special place in my life. Uh, currently, when I'm going back home, I'm in the process of writing my fifth space project. And um, we are currently with Cybernetica. That's actually one of the oldest IT companies. We are 25 years old, a spin-off of the Estonian Academy of Sciences, Institute of Cybernetics. And uh, in my team, we are doing already the second space-related project that is exactly in cybersecurity. And we are researching machine learning, how to help cybersecurity specialists in reducing the burden of ever increasing hazards that are attacking us from outside and from inside. And also, mm, <laughs> uh, what? This space-related uh, bug hit us already from DARPA. Uh, ShareMind, that technology that Cybernetica develops, uh, was 
was uh, participating in a DARPA uh, project of uh, computing on encrypted data. And suddenly a general came and showed one very long integral asking, can you guys do this? So uh, Dan Bogmar, my boss, currently the head of R&D in Cybernetica, uh, went back to the team, showed the integral. <laughs> so next time uh, they met, yeah, we said, yes, we can do it. Uh, then we showed this uh, implementation uh, of computing that particular integral on fully encrypted data. And well, uh, the generals were rather happy. And then they asked, it, can you do it faster? <laughs> uh, Dunn went back to the team uh, that we were thinking about what to do with it. Then uh, the computation was map reduced and parallelized. And in half a year, we came back and showed some magnificent uh, performance improvements. And uh, well, uh, <laughs> I haven't heard, uh, seen Dan so happy for a long time. He was showing videos of uh, generals uh, being uh, surprised. <laughs> well, not there, but it was just a video of something uh, smashing happening. And uh, from there, uh, this idea that, uh, well, uh, there are interesting space programs also in Europe. Let's try to write a proposal and start cooperating in Europe. Well, uh, uh, like they say, these first uh, COVs are uh, uh, not so successful. We didn't understand the system, how it worked, uh, what ESA was expecting, how to approach the system. Uh, we were just sort of writing a pro proposal and a little bit sad afterwards that didn't, didn't succeed. Then like um, several, several years, uh, maybe even three or four later, uh, suddenly there was again a proposal that was uh, kind of interesting for ESA because ESA was re researching machine learning and uh, finding all sorts of different applications and it was a whole sort of strategic shift in ESA to push forward machine learning in the context of everything that ESA is doing. So uh, we were lucky to have all these skills in the same company, like cybersecurity, uh, machine learning, and also uh, actual, um, well, the um, innards of a cybersecurity operations center. And uh, that was how I came included in that project because uh, there was a fine professor driving the idea, the, everything was cool, but then somehow uh, it needed this management side also and the project management side. And my background is applied math from Tartu University, statistics also. Uh, I managed uh, R and well, uh, and data analysis company uh, Resta for 17 years from, well, from just me uh, up to some 20 people and we were doing uh, business uh, also uh, well, with uh, really nice big global companies and uh, driving best practices from Estonia to the global branches. And uh, that was this uh, side well, my MBA is from Cleveland, Ohio, uh, together with Central European University. So it was this mix and match of different competences that was needed and uh, seemingly also from these other projects that uh, we see, uh, we have been writing to ESA, that ESA likes different, uh, uh, these comp uh, competences coming together in one team. It doesn't have to be one company it may be a consortia, uh, but they are seeking very specific skills and they are so wonderful in uh, managing R&D that uh, every time we get feedback from ESA, even if it's something, guys, we don't accept your deliverables, please rewrite them. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, it's delightful because uh, there are actually specialists doing uh, their work very well 
ESA has a very strong engineering culture. Uh, they're not bureaucrats, although the processes might seem very difficult. But think, if you're sending stuff up there, uh, you need to be very, 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 very careful. And that actually comes to my sort of professional first uh, contact with space technologies. Uh, nowadays, people know HACCP. Does anybody know this? Uh, okay, it's about hazards, risks, and uh, whew, and critical control point analysis. It's uh, uh, coming from the 60s. Uh, well, actually, a space mission was compromised because somebody got a uh, stomach bug. And then uh, NASA started thinking that, well, there are different hazards, there are different control points in preparing stuff for space. So we need to have a methodology that not just sort of measures the end result if something went bad or actually succeeded, but looks into the process, how stuff gets manufactured, where uh, something can go wrong, and uh, how to control it, how to measure that this critical control point is actually performant, and for instance, uh, stuff doesn't spoil or bugs don't go into your food. And it was uh, Irish Quality Association that uh, wanted to manage the retail stores according to this HACCP and management uh, auditing practices uh, that uh, stores like Spar or some other brands that we don't know here in Estonia uh, could control how they prepare stuff how their stores are looking. And when I started learning about that methodology, it came out that, well, it's actually a well-known well uh, space methodology that the uh, food industry has adopted. And when I learned a little bit more, uh, it had actually roots in the Second World War, uh, where most of the, um, this, um, what are these? Uh, Stuff that the uh, cannons shoot out. Cannon, well, this that to explode. Well, uh, actually, at that time, the majority of those cannonballs did not explode. And that was a quality management problem. So uh, some kinds of uh, this critical uh, control point analysis stuff was already coming from the, the Second World War, uh, but only when NASA picked it up and uh, worked on the methodology. And further, the food industry uh, deployed it all over became this uh, uh, methodology widely accepted and known. So in a sense, what is happening uh, uh, regarding to ESA also, we see that uh, technologies that have been uh, used somewhere in uh, uh, well, non-space industries or that uh, could have an interesting application in space. Uh, are taken over by companies who really know how to de-risk the technologies. It's something. It's not something that you, well, brave startup, you go and immediately do your first project and voila, you are a unicorn. No, it's actually a year-long pro process. You start from some early concepts, you show that the concept actually works, and then gradually, gradually, you de-risk the technology, show it in different environments, show how it performs, what are the critical factors needed to it. And that's the beauty of working together with ESA or uh, space R&D drivers. Uh, I, for instance, use the ESA type of risk management in every project that I manage. I also use the um, ESA examples of answering to tenders. They have very specific uh, 
ways of showing that you are meeting all the requirements of the uh, uh, tender or offer of the tender. And uh, when we looked at other uh, tenders and other uh, customers, we saw that actually this uh, process that uh, we saw and learned in ESA can be a small, small uh, competitive advantage showing that we are really cool. We know how to evaluate, we know how, what the customer actually wanted. We pick up those, whoa, 160 requirements from full text <laughs> and show that, yes, we have thought about everything, but we don't meet some of them because we have better alternatives. What does it communicate to a customer when you show that you really, really, really have thought full, through all the requirements and that you are at least on par or going over it. And uh, that's why I'm recommending to everybody to sort of find this first step or the opportunity that is suitable for you. Either it's uh, uh, priming uh, in, uh, in an idea competition. ISA has open idea competitions all over. We got our first feedback for this uh, idea that we proposed back in three days. Uh, we had to work uh, with a free member team for a month in order to raise <laughs> the quality of the offer. But uh, it is always, always very uh, valuable and it uh, enhances your competence. So please do try to get these opportunities or working together with ISA and try to learn from that very wise uh, driver of R&D. Thank you. Thank you, Baldur. Next up, we have a session of keynote, sorry, not keynotes, <laughs> uh, startup pitches. First up, we have coming to the stage uh, Wayron, TrackDeep, Spaceit, and CTF Tech. The way it is built up is that we first have a three, minute, three minutes for the pitch, then uh, um, three minutes for uh, questions as well. Uh, so after the pitch, you can raise your hand and ask your questions. First, please welcome on stage Henry Harm, CEO of Wayron. Hi, thank you for joining the session. I'm Henry, CEO and founder of Wayren, where we deliver critical information. So one of the challenges as we are now more and more removing the operator from the vessels is how we provide this, uh, how we provide, um, uh, how we can share what is happening around it with the operator and uh, provide um, safety. Now, uh, mostly with the Estonian Defence Forces, we have developed a communication platform that can uh, uh, share critical information in extremely demanding conditions. And uh, this we can do with firstly pairing uh, several communication technologies at the same time uh, and uh, using extremely efficient data synchronization algorithms. Now, how we can uh, leverage this in the use case I mentioned before? We have worked with Mindship uh, uh, with uh, surveying the seabed with a fleet of drones. The operator will send the operational uh, mission uh, via Satlink, and uh, now we can provide extremely fast direct contact with uh, uh, individual vessels to share information that, for example, a sailor has been spotted in the area and we can uh, react fast. Uh, as this is an extremely uh, dual-use oriented technology, we are actually fielding a solution of uh, automating indirect fires for the Estonian Defence Forces. This we are currently fielding, uh, testing in Estonia and preparing to field in Ukraine. After which we will um, start looking at more in the civilian market. 
Now the business model is quite simple. There is a subscription fee based on the number of devices connected in the network, but we are looking to work with different partners to integrate into end-user products. Uh, and uh, the team, we have a team of professionals mainly from the Estonian Defence Forces related to the battle management system that we are currently using. And uh, to end up, I also wanted to show a quick video about the solution uh, on the field. If it's possible to switch to that. Oh, yep. So we have, uh, this is the example for the Estonian Defence Forces. We are sharing uh, locally information about uh, the enemy that we need to affect with uh, indirect fires. And we have a mortar team getting an extremely simple report about uh, what ammunition and what angle we need to put the weapon at and confirm that the fire has been shot. And uh, that's a very brief introduction about our technology. I would be happy to take any questions. Yes. Yes, thank you. If you have any questions, now would be the time to raise your hand. Yes, please. Yes, so I'm John, and uh, <laughs> the role that you were showing right now... Yes, uh, we provide the communication platform, so we don't uh, develop the end-user application. So what we did for the Estonian Defence Forces, we took their um, communication equipment, such as Harris, such as analog radios, and we took their uh, indirect fire system, Toro, and we put them together and provided a um, way of the soldiers to actually use it on the field, because Toro is meant for HQ use currently. Uh, the solution was just tested uh, a few weeks back during the exercise wind by the uh, by the artillery forces, so they were ha very happy. Okay. It was uh, actually they managed to do their process in three minutes, which usually without any they are able to achieve the same speed without doing any errors. But it reduces the amount of errors, automating the whole process and making it extremely simple. Now uh, regarding the IP question. Um, as we have a lot of uh, different uh, uh, data synchronization models and algorithms inside, that uh, part we can protect with patents, and the whole software solution and concept can be also protected with uh, combining with those or with um, uh, copy protection. Currently, we are testing. As we are, uh, our first market is the military market, we really need to see that the last 5% is also working on the field. So we're going to be testing in Estonia and in January we're hoping to launch our product in Ukraine. We have a local partner who is uh, building the local fire support system with 10,000 plus users and we are launching there. Great. Thank you, Henry. And next up, we have coming on stage uh, Andy Wiegma from uh, the Track Deep. Hello, <clears throat> hello everybody, nice to be here. Uh, my name is Andy Wiegma and I'm a co-owner co uh, and CEO of uh, TrackDeep. Uh, drone detection sensors mainly uh, designed uh, by military, and th that's why uh, they are very expensive and, and not uh, uh, widely used, and uh, mainly used in military segment. Every military-grade uh, sensor uh, uh, they have their own uh, drone detection software that ma which makes integrating multiple sensors in one software and platform quite complicated. Um, there's no need for long-range military sensors for civil, civil, civilian clients. Uh, we are going to change that. You need to, to use uh, military range uh, sensors. 
uh, uh, tractive software allows the use of the self uh, of self products uh, uh, that you do not need to have special software in it and it means the client can go to shop and buy simple cameras or different sensors to protect their airspace. Tractive software collects the data from different sen sensors, combines them and to create the motion patterns which allows the AI to profile and categorize the objects. With Tractive software, uh, cameras, radars and other sensors, you can integrate everything in one, one system. Uh, this, uh, the software is ready and tested to, to protect single parameter, single perimeter, multiple uh, perimeters or large areas like uh, national borders. Uh, we are testing it right now and it will be ready uh, next year. Uh, our, our biggest uh, target is to reach uh, to protect uh, uh, drone, uh, co uh, drone flight corridors. Uh, over the cities and uh, other areas. Uh, we are here to find uh, investments to start up, to start uh, build up our sales team and uh, uh, of course uh, improve our AI. Our team is right now two persons only, uh, but both are very well, well, well know what they are doing, and uh, oh, that, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Um, now for questions. Okay. Yes. Uh, we are uh, we are right, right now developing and uh, trying to understand what is our business model will be. But uh, I think it uh, we are focusing that it, this is a uh, uh, we are se selling at, as a service at month, monthly monthly or yearly uh, payments. It means that uh, we are keep the syst uh, systems updated. Clients can easily uh, add sensors, so the system works like this. Uh, our, our target is build up the build up the team. Uh, at first, I think the raising number is uh, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand. All right, perfect. Any other questions? Thank you. Th thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have coming on stage Silver Lodi, CEO of Spaceit. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Silvia Lodi. I am CEO of uh, Spaceit. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, our infrastructure for satellite communications and how we offer it as a service. Uh, first of all, uh, I will give you a quick insight about um, mission control and ground station services and satellite operations. So um, operating a satellite uh, requires mission control and ground station services. You cannot um, have a satellite mission without it. And uh, mission control is a set of tools and activities uh, needed to operate satellites. Ground station services are the uh, terrestrial uh, radio stations and rele uh, related services to communicate with the spacecraft. And all in all, um, today uh, we can say that satellite operations cost uh, can amount up to two thirds of the entire uh, space mission, satellite mission budget. Um, as for uh, the uh, mission control um, mm, solutions today, then um, they're quite expensive, not scalable. Most of them uh, developed in-house. Uh, they tend not to uh, support multi-satellite constellations. All in all, they're uh, expensive and uh, not scalable, many of them at least. 
As for the ground station services, then usually one ground station uh, enables one hour of communication, day, uh, communication time per day with a satellite. And usually a satellite um, is connected with one ground station network because uh, the other integrations are quite expensive to do. And uh, although 24-7 yeah, um, uh, radio communication is still uh, possible, uh, uh, but because of the ground station services is, uh, uh, is fragmented, then it is um, quite difficult to, to have uh, cross-network communication. So what we offer is uh, one platform for satellite communications. It consists of uh, mission control, ground station services, and cyber defense exercises features. Um, we have a, a subscription-based business model, whereas um, we aggregate ground station services uh, on our platform. We include uh, the mission control uh, features for commanding and controlling of satellites, and we sell it to the satellite operators, whether private ones or, uh, or uh, public and, and educational ones as well. And today we have a team of uh, 14 people, 10 of them you can see here. We have been hiring lately. Today we have reached a, a good number of people uh, who are very acknowledged in, in our field. And um, as for um, the uh, traction, then uh, we are supporting a commercial satellite mission this year. We have been doing uh, actively business with the European Space Agency. Uh, we will uh, continue onboarding new customers and partners and hopefully we will also test uh, a payload uh, which is operated by us uh, uh, in space next year. Uh, we have successfully fundraised and um, yeah, I think uh, to the stars then. Thank you very much. So do you have any questions please? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now time for questions. All right. Yeah. How many paying customers do you already have in your portfolio? Yeah, we have. Yeah, we have today uh, three. F sorry, no, four paying customers. Uh, the the pipeline is already quite okay, I think. Uh, below 100, I can say. <laughs> but the second question uh, is that uh, what has been the major obstacles to go to the market and scale your business? Because you are cheap, you are good, and software is doing everything. Yeah, but uh, I think there hasn't been... No, okay, in the early days, uh, I think, uh, since we have been around already some years, so uh, in the early days, uh, the, the most uh, uh, often obstacles were related with, um, or common obstacles were related with funding part. So uh, coming from Eastern Europe and, uh, and in space industry, it is quite unusual. So finding investors uh, locally, it is, of course, uh, at most in unusual. <laughs> And also, I think uh, what has supported us uh, lately is the development uh, of the whole industry uh, and moving from in-house solutions to off-the-shelf solutions, as well as the um, uh, entities involved in the whole uh, space economy. So, uh, so this, this number of, uh, of organizations has increased lately. And so, yeah, today I think uh, not so many uh, obstacles anymore. So, thank you. Yeah. Do you okay. believe the environment has changed for you? The environment has definitely uh, changed to, what, to some extent and it has improved uh, generally. Okay. All right, yes, we have a question there. Uh, they are our main partners, yes. And, uh, so uh, my question is, uh, how many ground stations uh, you have as, uh, as pharmacy? Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's a very good question. So um, today uh, we are integrated with two ground station networks. Uh, and they have, uh, I think, over 100 different separate ground stations in their network. Uh, the uh, process uh, of integration is ongoing with another two. And one project that we are doing uh, with the European Space Agency 
includes actually the aggregation of the ground station services on our platform. And so our target is to uh, demonstrate the cross-network connectivity between different ground stations and, and satellite using our platform early next year. Thank you. Right. Excellent. Thank you, Silver. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. <laughs> next up, we have Mark Gitti Honava Greg from CTF Tech. Hello, everybody. Uh, very nice to be here. I'm the CEO of uh, Estonian cyber education company called CTF Tech. What we do at CTF Tech is we provide gamified cyber education solutions. And when doing that, we use uh, cyber range technology. So we have our own uh, cyber education and gaming platform that is connected to a cyber range. So we shape the next generation of cyber talents. What we are known for uh, is uh, globally is we are organizing uh, cyber battle of series. Uh, that could be a cyber battle of any city or country in the world. Uh, this year, this weekend, uh, we are having a cyber battle of Nordic Baltics in uh, Tartu, big students' competition, and uh, all our competitions are designed in a way that they are based on real-life incidents. So we are bringing real-life cyber incidents, and recently more and more also space-related incidents to our trainings. And uh, this is how last year's cyber battle of Estonia looked like. So hope to see you all uh, this weekend in Tartu for Cyber Battle of Nordic Baltics. And our ambition for the next year is to organize also Cyber Battle, Space Edition, European-wide competition for students because they deserve interesting content and uh, a new way to learn uh, cybersecurity. Thank you. Right. Right, excellent. Uh, now for questions. Yes? Uh, what is our mission is to uh, bring cybersecurity to the wider audience, so we don't deal with talents only. And we advertise it actually as an adventure for students. Uh, so uh, when they enter our trainings, uh, they are friends with computer, but we don't expect them to know anything about cyber. We start with Linux basics and, and uh, move forward from there. Yeah, um, firstly here. We are developing further our cyber education and gaming platform. 
So our clients, uh, there will be in the future educational institutions, uh, also uh, recruiters, uh, and also individual players. Uh, but the platform is, uh, we are not selling it yet, we are testing it. So currently we uh, sell the events as such. But in the future, the events will be actually marketing and the revenue comes from the platform. Was there a question in back? Yep. Yes, there are still a lot of people who are afraid of cybersecurity as being something that is uh, uh, technical, difficult. Uh, we are trying to overcome this fear uh, with students uh, with uh, different ways. For example, one thing that we are doing is uh, we are combining robotics with cyber, because robotics are in a wider uh, masses. Uh, we design uh, cybersecurity events which are related to robots, because robots are vulnerable as well. Uh, and uh, uh, sp on space-related issues, we, uh, and in general, we try to make the trainings as interesting as possible for, uh, for kids and, and students who train with us. Uh, to overcome again this uh, fear that uh, uh, cybersecurity is not for me, it's too difficult. Uh, we also opened Girls Cyber Academy together with the University of Tartu because uh, uh, we think that uh, this particular area ne needs uh, special attention. So girls, girls are even more afraid whether I can do it with all these guys, compete here. So we want to uh, overcome this fear and bring uh, cybersecurity to the wider audience because uh, uh, in all the sectors there are experts missing. It's not only in IT. Uh, for example, even uh, agri agriculture, you need cybersecurity experts there. All right. Thank you, Marki. <laughs> Now, we are switching it up a bit. We have a panel discussion coming up. So, it will be about how to attract investments in deep tech. And the moderator of the panel is, uh, I once again welcome on stage, Paul Lias, the head of space policy at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you, Sander, for the introduction. And um, now we are going to the panel about deep tech and investing into deep tech. And therefore, I would like to at first uh, invite our uh, panelists. We will start with Maud uh, Mulak from uh, ESA. <laughs> then uh, Jan Bogdanov, the co-founder of uh, Lightcoat Photonics. And also Riva Anton, uh, founding partner from a Special VC. So please come here and uh, take a seat. As I mentioned uh, during the introduction, then um, we have a very nice KPI in Estonia that uh, by, 20, by the year 25, we should have 25 unicorn companies. In addition to this KPI, we have the minister an additional one, which means we need to have 500 deep tech companies. And uh, the first I heard the, this 500 from the minister, it was, <laughs> I said, just nice, because it means that we need to have more investments to the space domain. And uh, so it's one of my favorite uh, KPIs. But of course, here the question is, what exactly is a deep tech company? Because I, I, I think there are many ways how, how to define what is deep tech company. And um, so it's also maybe one topic we can uh, maybe uh, talk later on on this panel. But it would be very nice to start with uh, uh, Jan with you. Uh, so you are exactly <laughs> in the middle. And because uh, you are the only one from here as a startup experience. And I think Lightcoat uh, Photonics is a very good example from a deep tech company, how it uh, can be successful. And maybe you can tell at first what you are doing and uh, then uh, how you were be, how you were able uh, to raise raise venture capital, and what are the you know what were the difficulties in doing that? 
Yes, thank you, Paul. Very good questions. Um, what we are, we have a pitch coming up, so I'm not going to <laughs> spoil too much right now. But uh, we have um, uh, we are building a 3D camera, so um, for the mobility sector, basically. And actually, the story of Litecode is uh, is is from real life. Um, it kind of turned out that um, our CEO uh, was working in uh, in an Estonian uh, robotics company. Um, and uh, I was uh, actually working at the same company, but I was also in the University of Tartu doing my master's thesis. And we, when we worked in that company, we understood that there, were, there was a certain technological gap between the requirements of, um, of a sector and, the, uh, and, the, and what that technology at that, that time was able to provide. So, and it turned out that uh, Coincidentally, as it always happens to be in universities, the, our laboratory, which where I was doing my master thesis, it was actually working on so working on, on some problem, and it ki kind of made sense at that time that we, we kind of understood that oh, you could use it for you could use it to solve that problem, because we immediately because we had high technical background, we understood that there was a sig significant technological gap uh, and uh, and we could do that so we basically um, we, we at, the, at that time it took some time to really to, to settle in that thought so actually I started my PhD as well in University of Tartu uh, I'm on an ac academic leave so that's okay uh, but uh, but that deep tech uh, it kind of for us it, it was this uh, immense, let's just say, knowledge from previous, for, we have four co-founders, and uh, it was this immense knowledge from, from, from the experience of, our, all, of our, all of our founders, uh, which allowed us to combine that information and the experience from uh, private sector, which we kind of combined, and uh, of course the igniting will of, uh, of founders and of course the, uh, of our, and our CEO, Heli. So, Pretty much that it was the uh, con the conditions of the environment the re and the market need and a happy coincidence that we were working on the problem in the university. So as always, I don't know if that if that answered the question. But how was it uh, for you, for example, raising venture capital? How what were the difficulties? You know, one thing is to have a very good team. Uh, you have it, but you know, it's not all. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, very, very quickly, uh, we started out by um, Hilly got some contacts uh, from from the uh, company she worked in, and uh, she met a first believer, and we invited him into our lab, and we showed him what we do, and that's where it started rolling. So he, this uh, believer, had contacts, and he knew uh, he knew which buttons to press. So it kind of, it, it, in the end, it turned out to be a networking question at that time, in addition to all the other bricks that had to be in place. So again, maybe a happy coincidence that Heli knew that person. It maybe if you, we've got, in, it got into that network a bit later, uh, it would have been also cap uh, possible, but uh, that was a significant push. Uh, and this person did not just come with funds, he also had vision and belief that this is something that uh, that is going to potentially change the world. So that was what it is. Okay. Rivo, are you also a believer? Do you believe in deep tech? <laughs> I do, and actually we are also the, uh, one of the first investors in Lightcode. Actually, I believe we, we even led your first round. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I think deep tech for, for investors um, have some advantages over non-deep tech companies and many disadvantages as well, but maybe <laughs> the advantages would be that um, the defensibility is, is much stronger with, with, uh, with those cases. And, and you started off with, with um, uh, conceptualizing about the definition of deep tech. I think for many investors, actually, uh, deep tech is what maybe 50 developers can't copy in a year. So this could be a very sort of like a street definition for, for deep tech. And, and I think it exactly um, 
refers to the fact that, that um, there's more defensibility. What are the main challenges if you are investing into deep tech or well there are there are many uh, there are many one of one of the main things maybe is the time horizon that usually you know um, to develop a, a product in deep tech is is um, it's a very lengthy uh, uh, process um, even though compared to maybe like just you know usual uh, uh, internet technologies and uh, I have a good example uh, maybe that describes the complexity of things. Um, Ahti Heinla, who is uh, co-founder of Skype, but also co-founder of a Estonian deep tech company called Starship, he says that when the complexity of Skype was one, then the complexity of Starship is 1,000. So, you know, uh, that's maybe kind of like uh, explains, uh, you know, the time horizons and maybe the hours and, and, and uh, intellectual sort of thought that needs to go into the uh, deep tech concept. Um, then, of course, for, for many investors, one of the barriers is also just understanding, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what it is, because the uh, majority of the investors actually are uh, social scientists, I mean, you know, business backgrounds or, or whatever. And even if they are engineers, you know, Deep Tech has so many verticals, it's, it's just hard to, you know, uh, hard to grasp everything. So you need to have a good network or access to e experts that can, can really explain what's, what's going on. And with Lightcode, actually, we were maybe also somewhat lucky that we, we knew a person that kind of <laughs> knows LiDARs and, and LiDAR technology. So we, it kind of, um, he, he kind of like uh, acted as a maybe translator for us. So many barriers, but you know, all of them can be overcome. If you are talking about barriers, then it's very good to continue with ESA. So, um, how can ESA help here, or what's um, yeah, exactly how can ESA help deep, uh, deep tech companies to grow? Well, um, we have several ways of supporting deep tech companies. Um, there's different programs inside of uh, ESA. For example, the BUS program, Business Applications and Space Solutions, offers specific funding for, spa for ideas that integrate space data and information. But also we have, um, for deep tech companies looking for ideas and who have a space element in them, we can definitely match them with investors. And that is done by, um, inside of the program that is now proposed called Scale Up. And uh, through it, we kind of try to support um, the companies in all the member states. Um, however, it's also up to the companies to tell us how we can support them best, because it's not an all one one key suits everybody and sometimes we can look into different um, different approaches and different types of funding and funding is sure a key but also being an ESA BIC and light code photonics is also um, coming from an ESA BIC usually uh, opens up some doors not all of them but some <laughs> and uh, so we we are always looking out for for new ways of supporting companies and uh, I don't know maybe maybe they can give us some pointers now before we are going to the tips, what are the best uh, success stories from ESA side? So if you th think about uh, space deep tech companies, so maybe you can, who have been not only in Estonia, but maybe in a broader picture from ESA PIC. Space? Deep Let's say deep tech? tech companies, as you have been, ESA PIC has been working on. Do you have so any interesting ESA, example? ESA big companies have, uh, we have already incubated uh, 1,200 companies up to now. And uh, Rijo, maybe you can help me out on the deep tech uh, <laughs> example. But um, out of the top of my head, um, we I cannot give you one specific one, but we do a lot of... Um, space development for example in belgium i know a very good uh, uh, a good example well light code photonics does but i would not characterize them as deep tech so that's why i have trouble answering your question mm -hmm. maybe you can give me a definition first Ooh, Rivo, how would you like to <laughs> <laughs> as an investor how to define deep tech <laughs> yeah well i i think the easiest really would be go uh to go by the volume of effort that needs to go in to produce a product. So whatever, you know, 50 developers can't copy in a, in a year would be, a, I mean, it's very simplistic, but 
but maybe I, I would stick to this uh, for, for now. So it's basically all the space companies, the majority of space companies are deep tech companies. Upstream companies and also mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the unicorn, the German unicorn um, that we had. Lilium? Thank you. <laughs> Lilium is one of our um, uh, deep tech, I would think, uh, companies. So. Okay. What we have seen in Estonia, for example, uh, one of the first success stories, I think I mentioned it before, was uh, Skeleton Technologies. So they re really, Grove started with the first ESA project. ESA helped to validate that actually what they're doing, it's worth mm -hmm. investing it. So Riva, how do you see it? Is ESA the easiest way for venture capitalists <laughs> to validate if the company is worth it uh, or not? Um. Yeah, I, I, I'm afraid I, I have um, maybe a, a little uh, would information. Would you trust ESA? <laughs> uh, I, I would prob probably would, but, but I think the question is actually an interesting one. And I believe that in deep tech, uh, investor gener investors generally want to go uh, after the concept where they see a market pull rather than you know you, you need to push it to the market. And unfortunately, many deep tech concepts actually are the ones that need you know, to be pushed on the market. However, if you have a larger player like ESA that kind of creates like the market pull, you know, th this is definitely an advantage for, for an investor and kind of like validates or improves that uh, this could be something. I, I think I concur with you because um, in the beginning, you know, uh, I've seen several companies that uh, have great ideas, but um, just don't know their markets enough to be able to to really concretize their products and their services. And with time, um, with this initial kind of, well, it's beyond the friends and family investments, right? And it's before the Series A, but it's mm. a kind of like, we think this could work uh, type of funding that is provided by the ESABIX, um, but also I would not uh, disregard the companies who, the existing companies, not only startups, that want to open up to a new market. As you can see with, um, with Light Photonics, where you um, basically did a spin-off and did a technology transfer, and those types of companies are also um, quite interesting to, to look into. And in inside of ESA, we also have a technology transfer office, and they're going to make available the, um, the patents of ESA to, uh, to companies. And that is also part of scale up. And um, we are, we're trying our best to, uh, to, to identify the, the correct player so that we, you don't need to do too much of a triage. <laughs> um. Maybe a question to um, Lightcoat, uh, Photonics, Jan. What has been your experience with cooperation with ESA and uh, also in ESA Big Estonia so far? Lightcoat in general, um, we've looked to space applications. I think we looked at them right from the beginning. We considered them uh, partly um, because we believe that in the future, uh, space is more than just satellite propulsion and things like that. Uh, space is going to be if we're talking about off-planet uh, installations and whatnot, it has, let's just say that uh, there is a lot of touching points with the world we are living in on Earth as well. So uh, maybe uh, we just, we started thinking about ESA as, as one of the potential channels to start communicating with, to understand what are the space's requirements, and if possible, then we can take them into account as early as possible. So, for example, today, if there are certain service robots working on, on, on Earth, then perhaps in the future, or most likely in the future, we, lo we like to have automated vehicles in, in other places as well. So, so it's, uh, it's a transitioning, per transitioning period. And to complement the previous statement, that uh, I think that mark if there is a market pull on Earth and uh, certain tasks can be automized and whatnot, or, or if the companies can prove that a concept work, uh, that uh, for, for, for example, certain automation concepts work on Earth, then uh, it's not unfeasible to think that they could also be uh, uh, altered to work in space conditions or in space technology. So, so for us, it has been, uh, from the go, um, a clear choice. Uh, because we know that the future is going there. We know also that space is 
has some very interesting um, physical challenges, let's just say, physics-related challenges. <laughs> so uh, as early, if we can get to them, start tackling them early on, then that's, that's for the best. A number of uh, founders and uh, well-known people in general from the private sector and uh, mm -hmm. technology sector have said that the government should out, uh, stay out. If the government comes in, it's, it's bad. What do you think about it? So what should be, but if you're talking now about deep tech, is it really some, uh, an area where the government should say, okay, we are not dealing with it then? Or what's the role of uh, the government and deep tech? I have an idea on that. So uh, um, it's again related to Lightcode story. And uh, Lightcode wouldn't be possible if we didn't have uh, four PhD great founders. Now they got their PhDs in universities. And um, this is a critical thing that we have to think about in the future. And actually, in my opinion, uh, the government also has to think about is that uh, how are we going to ensure, how can we ensure that we have how many unicorns, some I don't know how many number of them are deep tech unicorns, uh, how, how, can we, how, how can the government help us to make sure that we have the processes and facilities and organizations in place that actually enable them? So in many deep tech companies, which are very hardware related, uh, ob obtaining certain skills that are required to run those companies isn't something you can look, look from the internet. You have to be physically inside a lab uh, tinkering with a device that costs $100,000. Uh, if you don't have, have, have access to that, then most likely you will never go into that field. So, so in my opinion, government's primary role, or at least one of the roles, would be to enable the uh, other, let's just say, core fundamental layers that need to be there before uh, deep tech in that sense can arise at all. But this is from my personal like uh, view. Yeah, I, I wouldn't underestimate the role of governments, and maybe I, I see um, um, the question two layered. One is education generally, and I think Jan already covered, you know, the scientific part of it. But I think it's also kind of important for the um, governments or public sector to build uh, scientific education in a way that it also involves business. I, I don't know for sure, but I think it's possible to get a PhD in Estonia without ever working every, any, anywhere, at least not in the private sector. And uh, as an investor, I mean, many, many, not several <laughs> times, but many uh, times we've, we've seen that, you know, uh, people are just too far into the science and, and too little into the business. And unfortunately, when building a business, uh, I mean, it, it, it's not doable that way. So I, I believe that something also needs to be changed on the education side. Uh, that's first. But secondly, also maybe um, with all of the financing and, and building the infrastructure needing, uh, needed for, for deep tech, that's also something where I believe there is a at least here in Estonia, a short, uh, a, a, uh, sort of like a market failure. Um, just to give an example, a, a typical fund lifetime is 10 years. You know, basically you invest and then, you know, you need to uh, liquidate your position in 10 years time. And typically it's even shorter because, you know, that would be if you invest the first year and, and exit the last. But, you know, sometimes, you know, it's, it's not the case. So typically you would need to exit in five to seven years. Um, now, if you think of Skeleton with the two or three rounds of bankruptcy, and I don't know what happened there, you know, in the beginning. No one talks about it. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think it, we need to be transparent. I mean, yeah. that's how it happened. So, so just 10 years is too short. And now if you look at the uh, volumes or the scale that Skeleton has, that's actually in Germany. So I, I think there are maybe two sort of learnings for us. Uh, first, that you know, maybe there wasn't enough financing or know-how, first of all, available here at the time when Skeletor was, was uh, first established. And secondly, once you start scaling the business, um, Germany appears to be a better place for, for, for Skeleton, at least for now. And I think much of it actually is, is the government grants that were available for, uh, for building those uh, um, 
semi-commercial or, or partly commercial uh, production uh, facilities. So I, I wouldn't underestimate really the, the roles of government and I think you know a lot of good things can happen. No, I agree. Yeah. I would say that um, deep tech can be in any industry. It can be in agriculture, it can be in aviation, it can be anywhere. And if we focus on if we say that the government needs to support deep tech, that's a very vague way of investing money. Uh, and while I do think that it is something that is needed on the long term to kind of explain the level of um, not the TRL, but the level of maturity that you would expect from a company to reach, um, the governments are sh and governmental budgets are structured in a way, and you know this better than I, me too, uh, that uh, they have priorities energy priority, maritime, space, space. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by, by saying that, um, if we could invest in deep tech, yes, deep tech is a tool. Well, I, I consider it as a, as a tool, not on the same level as AI or virtual reality or, but for me, it's, it's kind of like the fifth, the tool to which you arrive to your end, uh, the end goal. And the end goal is to answer a need in a market, a need that service need, a product need, something that will make money uh, to the company and to investors and create revenues and jobs. So, um, and in this regard, I, I join um, the, the, the other panelists in saying that education is, of course, very important. But I also think that the structured approach from, from government and intergovernmental organizations um, in, with regards to the local priorities, as well as with the strengths of the countries. Because here in Estonia, cyber is really a big strength. And if um, there were to be some new developments in cyber... <laughs> You never know. It could be it could be of a very big interest for for investors and for them to associate Estonia with the surface and capacity and to see that those tools are available here. So cooperation with DISA is key here, right? Of course. Always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously. What are the recommend recommendations to me? What should I and the Ministry for responsible for space do better? Or what should what do you think, what is missing uh, to really accelerate the growth of deep tech connected then to space, not to the other areas uh, I'm not involved in? Me? Feel <laughs> free. <laughs> um, that's a loaded question. Mm -hmm. um, we, have, we have five minutes, so. Okay, <laughs> okay. So, um, the... The ministry already is doing um, a lot, and uh, Estonia is investing both in ESA BICS, in uh, business applications, in the different structures that ESA offers, right? And um, I firmly believe that being alert on the the, the current market, um, the markets, the space markets, and also of the tools that will be required in the future is something that the ministry should always look out for. Um, I'm sure I'm, I'm an engineer, but I'm not also a, a, a seer of the future. So I don't exactly know the answers to those, but maybe it could be um, about testing, looking in how the, we're looking, sorry. So new space is going for COTS, for example, called commercial off the shelf uh, elements. What would make it normal for the future so are we going to be only using COTS and therefore um, we would need a type of testing facility for these, fac uh, for these um, elements? Do we want to test them all together and have a type of, um, I don't know, digital approach to it or having um, some some uh, keys, uh, some key tools like integration of 5G technologies and integration of um, AI, VR, like all of the those hype buzzwords, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how it could be looking into the future. And for that, I think you need to listen to the market and talk with industry because only they can know what is working with their clients. And uh, ESA has a certain perspective, but it's only... It's a very, it's an international one, but you would want, I guess, to focus on your local ecosystem. And those are the keys that will locally will be given to you. Mm -hmm. 
I agree with that statement, that focus. Uh, I don't know how, it, how to do it exactly, so, but uh, <laughs> the focus part <laughs> is uh, focusing on the strengths of this local community. In, in our case, Estonia, for example. So we, um, how to recognize those strengths is a difficult question. So, But uh, as a small community, we have our strengths and uh, hopefully we can like uh, put more emphasis on them. Uh, how to recognize them is a... Let's just say it. Not not in the two, this two minutes or three minutes. So <laughs> not in that scope, <laughs> I guess. We need another. Yeah, I don't have much knowledge like who has done what in the Estonian <laughs> space uh, system exactly, but um, maybe just a story. Actually, uh, uh, as as a kid, I I, I um, um, spent a lot of time in Turavere, which was like the space sort of like district for Estonia or village. Uh, because my father uh, worked there as a scientist and I remember that at the time most of the problems that those people were discussing were somewhat theoretical, like, you know, some basic, uh, you know, research on, on, on space. But what I see now, you know, you know, from from um, from media or, or where I see like different startups, I see that uh, our approach to space is much more applicable. And I especially maybe like that even here today, you know, the event is called space, but still, you know, we have startups that are sort of connected to space, but not only. And, and I think that's, that's the key, like sort of like multidisciplinary, uh, applicable uh, stuff. That's what the investors like. And I think that's what also like the, 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 the society benefits most of. Yes. Yeah, so earlier, maybe when I joined the ministry years ago, then uh, ESA or membership in ESA was seen more as a sign of quality for Estonia that actually we can be part of it. It means that our companies and also our public servants are worth it. But today, of course, uh, what I want to see is ESA bigger than uh, only being a member there, but uh, to really how it benefits and how it's the R&D institution for our technology companies. Not only space, but also we can see it much, much broader, agriculture, etc. So therefore, I think the cooperation with ESA, of course, should and it will grow. So I'm, we are doing the best uh, here, I think. Uh, but I know that in the audience, we have also maybe some questions. Normally, there are. Yes, uh, Andres, please. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, I don't think there's like uh, any special requirements for, for deep tech generally, uh, just to give you like the fund math. Um, most of the VC funds in the world do not return the money that investors put into them. That's a bad thing. Uh, the average funds, they maybe return one or 1.5 times the money that investors had, had invested there. And then like the better funds, maybe they return three to five times the money that has been invested into the fund. Um, so it means that whatever, you know, we invest into, we look at least um, five times return. Uh, and, and that's, I think, you know, where, where, where things start from. And as you know, many of those companies that we invest into need to cover actually the losses that we get from the others then typically I would say that uh, if it doesn't show that, you know, this could return 10 times the investments, probably it doesn't make sense to, to, to go into it. So we, are, we are about the returns, uh, of course, also for the society, but also for the investors. You have to make very bold uh, prediction or uh, forecast. And True. Let's say so, uh, it's a very lucky coincidence that uh, regarding this panel, even for a top science park, the likelihood is like a reference startup at the moment. And previously it was uh, skeletal <laughs> technologies. So if uh, from t tomorrow you can, here you are again, you can invest only in T tech, what would you do to have more likelihood uh, simi uh, similar uh, ideas and startups? Um, I, I, I really 
believe in to education. So I don't know what I would do as an investor, but but uh, you know I, I think generally stuff starts from the education, and and with, with the deep tech right now, I, I believe that there are some updates that we can do in the in the PhD level, uh, yeah. like the the programs that are offered uh, to PhD students, and I think they should involve more of business or or maybe more of like um, practical out of the out of the academia experience. I I support that claim because that's how Heli actually got this idea in the first place. And you need to see the real problem. At least usually you need, you have to see it with your own eyes. You have to feel it, um, and you have to kind of recognize the need. And but if by a happy coincidence you seem to have you happen to have a solution at hand, then that's great. Um, I can't say that it is perfectly that way that you will uh, you will see a problem and then you start looking for a solution. It sometimes is you have a little bit of both, yeah. uh, of, uh, some some bit of the problem, some bit of the solution, and then you start like digging in more deep. I, I would even maybe add that uh, it's not only about um, seeing the problem, but I think uh, one needs to see also the delivery, the delivery of stuff. Many scientists, to my experience, they have like you know. I'm asking the question, then they start solving it, you know, a month ago, and then you ask, how is it going? Yeah, but I, you know, the, the sample isn't really like perfect yet, and you know, this shouldn't be published. And I'm saying, you know, we don't want to publish, we want to, you know, have the direction more or less about it. And then, oh, yeah, but you know, it's not perfect yet. And then, you know, years go and nothing happens. So, uh, so I think the delivery is also something that, uh, that uh, people just need to have more experience with. But by no means, I don't want to be like the skeptic about the Estonian deep tech <laughs> or, or be, you know, education generally, but just, you know, what could be updated. Yes, uh, thank you for the panelists. And I really think that uh, education is the first thing we need for deep tech companies. So it's something we need to invest. And then, then of course, second thing is how to really get these companies growing with government and also private funding. So thank you for the panel. Uh, thank you for everyone for listening. So I don't know. I don't want to hold the stage up uh, for you know closed for the next pitches. We have 30 minutes until networking. I think the um, discussion can uh, also continue there. So thank you for the panelists uh, for being here and uh, Sander. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. And what an interesting conversation, really, really great ideas. And now we're going to move on with other pitches. We have, just as before, uh, three minutes for a pitch, then three minutes for questions. And we have coming up Jan again from uh, Lightcode Photonics. <laughs> So hello, um, I'm Jan, I'm a co-founder of Lightcode Photonics, and we change the way a robot looks at you. We believe in a world where mundane and dangerous tasks do not have to be performed by humans. Uh, and actually, we are already on our way there. Uh, logistics sector is making massive efforts to deploy mobile robots, and in the future, autonomous robotics will be, will be one of the cornerstone technologies to enable off-planet operations involving humans in space. However, these robots require quality data to make their day-to-day -day decisions. They need to understand what's around them, what's in front of them, and they need to understand where they are. 2D cameras are usually not enough for that. Uh, LiDARs are often expensive, and other solutions lack the fidelity or some other features to complete the task. The, uh, the market size is expected to be around 37 billion, and there is a huge technological requirement that needs to be solved. Lightcoat is building a compact and affordable uh, 3D camera. And here you can see our piloting partners at future customers who will use 3D data for maintaining the robot situational awareness, or doing obstacle detection, uh, path planning, and, but also doing positioning in conditions where GPS is not available, for example, indoors. In the long run, this will help to increase the uh, uh, autonomy of the robots and help their fleets to, uh, to pay off. Lightcoat's camera relies on a unique imaging principle. 
and a uh, high performance but affordable sensor. So here you can see how we, we uh, use a 12 pixel sensor to capture a 1500 pixel image. Uh, we have the secret sauce of increasing the res native resolution of the de detector by 128 times, or anything in between. Lightcode has been fortunate uh, to attract extreme talents that are all driven by vision. And they have various backgrounds from corporate to uh, startups. Two years ago, we started with uh, core founder, PhD grade founder team of four. Now we are 18 strong talents working in three offices over two continents, and we keep growing. We have a working camera demonstrator, and uh, in the seed round, we will start making money by selling the, ca selling the camera. We are fundraising to boost our commercialization and our manufacturing. And by the turn of the decade, the technology will be small enough to fit inside your smartphone. So you will see light go on ground, in air, at sea, and in space. Join us. Thank you. Right. Excellent. Now, a couple of questions, maybe. Yes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, software part is um, its a very good question. Um, today we are focusing very much on the hardware part. But because of the intrinsic properties of the camera, the software solution is, uh, let's just say, it's a bit of an un uncharted territory yet. We are working towards that. Today we are focusing on the hardware. And the, uh, the, the essence of that training isn't exactly something, it's how, how this thing is done in general, but the nature of the data we get from the camera is different. So I think there will be a lot of novel things we can... The data is more rich in some sense. In some certain other senses, it's maybe uh, less so than conventionally, you could think. But uh, the other aspects that we get, um, we believe that they help us to have better machine learning uh, uh, solutions as well. Yes, thank you. Please. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you are focusing your hardware development into other kinds of world, land, air, uh, water, and space. Isn't that growth? It is. Uh, today, actually, our beachhead market is in warehouse automation. But uh, we, do, we see that... Uh, there are many technologies and many applications that require, uh, require this type of technology. Today we are looking at warehouse because of, its, uh, because of the environment it is in and because the need there is the greatest. So, uh, so, so yes, we are like looking broadly, but also uh, in the shorter run, we are very focused uh, to get the first product out and solve a very concrete problem. Yes, thank you. All right. All right, thank you, Great. Jan. Thank you. Next up, we have Stefano from uh, Scudo. Correct. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Stefano Alberico. I'm the CEO and founder of, of Scudo. And uh, today, I would like to draw your attention to the cybersecurity uh, aspect of protecting, let's say, data communication and protecting also more in general uh, digital assets. And uh, one of the issues that comes in your mind or should come in your mind, usually when you discuss this kind of matter, is you think probably about, you know, encryption. You want to encrypt the data, protect the data. And uh, this, I would say, especially in space, is probably one of the I would really dare to say solved problem already. I mean, encryption is there. There is plenty of technology that can be used. But one aspect about cybersecurity which are often forgotten is actually the authentication of, let's say, your asset or try to identify who is talking to. And imagine this example. Um, you are, let's say, you want to deorbit a satellite. 
So to the orbit of the satellite, most probably you are going to send some commands to orientate the satellite and then eventually to switch on your thruster and aim the satellite to, to hit the Earth, basically, and burn in, in an atmosphere. So the key here is how to be able to identify and authenticate the uh, operator that sent the command to tell to the satellite, basically, kill yourself. And this is applied to, you know, intercept drone, how to protect the possibility that the drone could be hijacked, meaning executing commands coming from some rogue operator. So authentication is of often, let's say, I would say forgotten, but it's a very crucial element, and especially in space application, it's something I would say today almost completely missing. And technology on Earth are available. Uh, every day we use, you know, internet, we use digital certificate. Estonia is a very good example. But in space, there's nothing like this. So we have been actually developing, first of all, a cryptographic chip. So we have a hardware uh, executing cryptographic operations. And then a big job has been to try to integrate this kind of technology, for example, for space or drones. Those are the two types of applications we have been working mostly. And applying this in space, there is a lot of work to be done working with the protocol. So we spend a lot of time in, in integrating this. And, and one of the big difference also is that we are based in Europe. We are European, European-made technology, and it's verifiable. So the technology itself, the chip itself, can be uh, fully verified by, for example, any third party. We have application, as I mentioned, for satellite. So we can build you know, a ready-made solution with an object that can be installed on a satellite and encrypted communication. And on space, we are actually going to get uh, space uh, validation with our technology in basically in a couple of months. So in February, we're going to fly on the OPSAT, which is an excellent mission, an excellent opportunity for startups like us. And uh, Financially, we are, let's say, uh, self-sufficient, uh, uh, but of course, we are at the moment looking also for investors. We haven't done any round so far, so of course, everyone is, uh, in the audience is interested. We're here to answer all your questions. So that's it. Thank you very much. And if you have any question, let me know. Maybe Andres already. <laughs> 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 I should ask you directly. Or <laughs> <laughs> of yeah. course, of course. Rivo previously mentioned that before they started to think about uh, investing the life of photonics, they had a trustful partner who understood the technology. What about you? Do you have a trustful partners who is working for VCs who understand your technology? Well, that's, I would say, that was an interesting point also mentioned there. Yeah, that's one of the biggest challenges we have, and probably it was mentioned already, you know, when you talk. Yeah, we, because again, Talking to investors many times, they basically don't understand the issue and uh, don't see the issue. And then probably it's also, of course, not easy, but especially when applied to space, it's even something more scary. So um, let's say with this, uh, definitely you have a partner that, you know, understand the technology, understand the needs. Uh, the use case we have in there that I show briefly are matching perfectly the, you know, is a future plan. I mean, there have been cybersecurity plan related to that. So. And not only, let's say, data encryption, data communication, but there's a lot of work to be done also in a secure remote software update. So once you have your satellite there, how you change something, you know, update an algorithm or something. So all those use cases actually are very much, you know, spot on on, on what we are doing and what is looking for. So for us, it's an excellent partner, definitely. Please. Yes. Yeah, let's say um, the chip, let's say the technology per se, if you talk about the chip, you know, in the market is known as a hardware security module, HSM. So there are various in the market. The difference in there, whatever chip today you buy, microchip or Chinese or Japanese, is based on blind trust. You buy the chip, you, it does what it's supposed to do, but there is no guarantee that there is something else, let's say undocumented function. And that's a fact. So using, for example, FPGA technology, we can give to university to verify what's inside. So this is one aspect. 
The other aspect is that, yes, today we have you know, digital certificate on the ground, let's say on Earth, but in space there is nothing. There is not even a standard that supports usage of digital certificate. So we have done work on actually changing the, the protocol used in space to adjust to using the digital certificate. So in our view, we have a chip and a digital certificate in our endpoint, something that today is unheard of in space. So thank you, good question. I guess. All right. If, else. if no more questions, then thank you very much. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you. All right. To wrap up this session, we have our final pitch coming up. Uh, Heiko Mulder, CEO of Mindchip, please. Hello, my name is Heiko Mulder. I'm from uh, Mindchip. So we are developing an uh, autonomous robotic uh, boat. And what kind of problem we're trying to solve is that um, there is more and more infrastructure coming to, down to the water, which need to monitor all the time. There is cable, cable lines, uh, gas pipelines, offshore wind parks and so on. And the other things is in uh, harbors. Uh, in, only in the Europe we have uh, around 200 harbors where the water depth level is really critical and they need, they need to mo monitor this every, every, every week. And to solving these problems, we need to solve also this, uh, if we're talking about an autonomous vessel, uh, solve this uh, navigation um, uh, things, uh, situation awareness tasks. Um, this is our technology. We have a uh, two robotic boat. Uh, uh, it's a multi-purpose multi platform. You can add there different sensors. You can measure the sea bottom. Uh, you can measure some kind of parameters in the water. You can carry the cargo package, so on. And um, we can offer the sea bottom measurement five times cheaper than man at boat, maybe. And uh, the core technology there is uh, our smart uh, brain, which is sitting in the robotic vessel. But good thing is there that we can put this smart tower whatever swimming platform, and we have a autonomous uh, platform. We have 12 cameras there, five radars, satellite communication, 4G, Wi-Fi, and so on. Um, right now, where we see our uh, biggest market is a uh, wind park. There is a lot, lot of uh, is going on right now, and uh, so so much stuff is coming to the water that uh, it's what we need to scanning the sea bottom, and there is a really, really big business case. Uh, we have a uh, uh, looking at uh, how, how they're doing this bathymetric tasks um, right now, and comes out, out that one kilometer uh, uh, square kilometer costs around 10,000 euro, but we have calculated that we can do it uh, with robotic vessel around five times cheaper. Of course, uh, for us, uh, this uh, satellite communication is uh, everything. If you if you lo lo losing the communication, then we don't have a one million euro cost uh, robot anymore. So that's uh, that's why we are here also. Uh, we have some uh, uh, contract already and quite many development grant, and uh, we have invested uh, through these projects around one million euro already for our platform. Uh, of course, we are looking also uh, first investment. Uh, around half a million euro to go to the Europe market. This is our team. We have five PhD uh, uh, researchers in the board and also business, uh, business people. So that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Now, questions? <laughs> All right. Yes, please. You mentioned Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We want to go to the uh, offshore wind parks area and scan the sea, scan the sea bottom there. So we need a really accurate uh, positioning. It, what what is important for us and also the communication need to be bulletproof. That's that's the important that right now we have a satellite communication Iridium uh, platform. But there uh, comes quite uh, few data to the channel, and we can't send all the data what we want. 
and also the posi position, accurate position is, is missing in the middle of the sea. So, but in the harbor area, we, there we can do use this RTK GPS, and there is a there, there is a system works, but not op open sea yet. So, this we we want to integrate. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, some middle of the sea, maybe 20 centimeters or something like that, should be quite okay for us, or maybe 30, but not not not, not more. But uh, normal GPS is around two meter or something like that, so it not uh, gives uh, gives us what we want. But the question was, was, it, was it, uh, is it enough for you that you sit in that vessel? Uh, almost, yeah, almost. Okay. Uh, if you get a little bit better uh, accurate, then uh, of course it's better, but. 20 centimeters is quite okay to do this spatometer. What? You can understand where you are. Yeah, this yes, but uh, but if you want to send uh, some kind of robot down to the water and uh, want that the com robot comes uh, really accurately back, okay. or, or or you want to do this spatometer uh, sea bottom scanning, then uh, the p picture quality is depending on the accuracy. So. Okay. All right, anything else? Yes. Uh, yeah, we have uh, signed some pilot project, uh, uh, pilot project uh, uh, down. But but uh, where we want to use these smart uh, 3D cameras uh, to uh, park the boat in uh, in harbor really accurately, because we want to charge it autom autonomously, uh, and and uh, there we need to really accurately uh, find this uh, charging station. So. There we can use this kind of camera, I think. Yeah, yeah. Actually, we we just uh, installed one one of them in uh, Tallinn Harbor yesterday, oh. but uh, but uh, there we missing this uh, camera. <laughs> right now we're using some other sensors there. So. Okay. Yeah. If nothing else, then thank you, thank you Ego. All right, we have almost come to an end of our two-hour session. I would like to thank, on my side, all the speakers, the panelists, and all the pitchers. And I would like to welcome on stage Sven Lilla uh, from ESA Big Estonia, who is going to give a couple of closing remarks. Well, first of all, thank you all that you came here to uh, join us for the two hours of packed and packed of information. We had an overview of what's happening from state level. We had eight, seven different startups pitching who had totally different background. And we had a really nice and fruitful panel discussion on the future of deep tech, our own startups, and from ESA's view of what's been happening. So in my eyes, the cybersecurity and space tech, they are the drive forces for the uh, future innovations and knowledge. And we at Isabik Estonia are really happy that we've been in the middle of this, this. We can support all those activities that's been happening. So a round of applause to all the speakers and to whom who have been listening here. And now the most important part, I won't keep you much longer here because we have the networking happening. The same building here and now is your chance to actually grab the people you want to have a chat with and enjoy yourself. Have fun, talk with people, and really appreciate of you joining us today. First ever investor for ESA Investor Forum in Tallinn, Estonia. Thanks.